Hello everyone, Molten here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be starting a new middle game series focused on a topic I don't see often in YouTube videos or discussed in chess literature and that is the topic of pawn structures or pawn formations. Now there's so many different pawn structures you can reach in chess and it's difficult to cover every single one but I'm going to be covering in this series the most common ones that you're most likely going to reach from the various openings you play. Now even if you don't play a particular opening which reaches these um, pawn structures commonly it's still good to look at the videos because then you'll know when a transposition might happen in one of your games or your opponent is less likely to trick you into one of these positions without you realizing. So I'm going to present the plans from both sides so you get a sort of balanced view on how to play each of the positions. And yeah, I'm going to start off with the stone wall formation in this first video. And I hope you guys enjoy the video. Um, do feel free to like, comment, subscribe down below if you have any feedback. Otherwise, we'll jump straight into it. Okay, now we're going to start things off by looking at how to react against the stone wall formation. And it's most commonly played as white. Often white will play the move pawn to f4 or pawn to d4, followed by putting the rest of his pawns on essentially these dark squares. e3, c3, and then f4, like this. Now there are two major problems with this particular formation for white. Now the first one is that this bishop on c1, as you can see, is completely stuck. And there's only really two ways to get this bishop out. Later on, white will either have to play the move pawn to b3 and get the bishop out this way, either to b2 or a3. Or white will have to do this sort of long maneuvering with the bishop to try and get it outside the pawn chain this way. That's why sometimes white will often bring the bishop outside the pawn chain before uh, closing the pawn for formation up like this. Now as black though, in this particular case, we see there's one major problem for white in terms of his squares and that is this e4 square. Now the plan for black essentially is we want to trade off all the pieces except for this particular knight and uh, leaving white with that bad dark squared bishop and this will be the I ideal case scenario good knight versus bad bishop where we can sort of dominate on the light squares as we'll see in this particular game so here black played with bishop to f5 if white ever plays bishop to d3 then we're happy to exchange off these um, pieces now the game continued knight to f3 this particular game continued pawn to e6, bishop to d3, and we had a trade of bishops. Now, I'll also point out there's another plan which I often like to play if you want to be a little bit more dynamic, and that is the move knight to f6 followed by g6, and leaving your bishop back on f8 and developing it to the d6 instead. So this is a plan I uh, suggested in my repertoire video against the stone wall. And the idea is that if white ever captures, we capture back. We double our f pawns, but we get some dynamic attacking options by getting the open g file and castles pawn to e6. And I, I find that this is a relatively fun position to play if you want something a little bit more imbalanced. But going back to the positional plan, and that is to just trade off all the pieces, leaving white with that bad dark squared bishop. So the game continued bishop to d6, we had queen b6, castles, bishop to b2, rook to c8, and here white I believe made a mistake by trading a little bit too early. Now the reason I believe why he traded was because he might have some difficulty casting his king. Now, if he tries to castle the king too early then he might run into a tactic here. Can, um, maybe someone can pause the video if you want to try and work out what possible tactic black has here but if you just want to see the answer then the idea I believe would be pawn takes on d4 and okay white can recapture back with the c pawn but I think the idea is then black will play the move knight to b4 followed by infiltrating perhaps with a rook first on the c2 square and if white captures back with the e pawn then we see 
that this diagonal is a real problem so black will take take and then take here on e5 picking up some material because of the pin so i believe this is what white was afraid of and this is the reason why he exchanged the knights off a little bit early but this is fine i mean this is favorable for black as we said we're happy to exchange off all the pieces so that's one more piece towards our goal so now we just have to get rid of the bishops and the knights Okay, queen c7 was played so we have a little bit of shuffling happening in this particular game black played move queen to a6 trying to infiltrate into this d3 square and then the queen enters into the game on d3 now rook c1 was played and here black plays the move pawn takes d4 which puts white in a really tough spot because he can't capture back with the e pawn because then the f4 pawn is hanging after a queen trade and then bishop takes on f4 is a real problem therefore if he tries to take back this way it's also really really bad because now all the pawns are stuck on these dark squares impeding the bishop's uh, movement and here we can just perhaps trade rooks and it's, it's just very difficult here to defend the pawns on the queen side for white I mean, you can play queen c2 bring your rook across bring your bishop to b4 we have an excellent position here. So that's why after pawn takes on d4, white went for some complications with the move knight to c4. Now, on the surface, it looks good because there's some tricky tactics here for white, but really it doesn't do anything and it actually helps us reach our goal faster because after the move queen g6, white was forced to capture, capture back, and then capture here. And this is essentially what we wanted. We wanted a position with a good knight versus bad bishop. And we're actually going to make the bishop even worse by playing this move. Rook to b6 in this position. Essentially forcing all the pawns to go to dark squares. Now white would have loved to play c4 to keep the bishop semi-active here. But unfortunately pawn takes on c4 means that white can't recapture back because the bishop is hanging on the b2 square. So this is why he couldn't play this move and he was forced to play the move pawn to b4. But after move pawn to b4 we see the bishop is stuck and it's a really bad piece for white. The rook returns to the c6 square now black just puts everything on light squares and they're just um, untouchable. So we have h5, knight e4, queen f5 again just playing on the light squares, pawn to f6. At this stage black is just improving pieces rook to c4 really just looking for an opening here and finally white decides to play the move pawn to f5 seeing that he needs to activate some of his pieces and he's willing to sacrifice a pawn to do so but in fact black is not even interested in taking it uh, because this gives perhaps a little bit of counterplay against the d pawn and the b pawn White might play the move queen to b5, for example. I think this is white's idea. So instead of allowing any counterplay, black simply just plays the move knight to g5. And then we get a trade. Again, white is in full control over the light squares. And then drops the knight back where it goes to f5 or c4. And after the move bishop c1, knight f5, white is dropping a pawn on c3 now. The rook goes to e2 and actually white just resigned here because black is going to play the move rook takes c3 and then after rook takes rook takes all the pawns here will drop in white's position so as you can see um two major problems for white um e4 square and this bishop proved to be decisive in this particular game so let's have a look at i guess a more positive example of when you can play such a structure and uh, uh, do well with it. So just to highlight transpositions in this particular case, I'm going to start this out from say a London system, which is a very popular system a lot of people play. You can also play this say the Trompovsky. You might reach this type of position as well. So this game went e3, knight f3. Uh, main line for for black here. Just playing bishop d6, castles, bishop g3 c5 uh, pawn to c3 black played queen c7 
So in this position here, Black's idea is to play knight to d7 and open up the position with the move pawn to e5. Now, in order to prevent this white play to move knight to e5, and after the move knight to c6, white plays the move pawn to f4. Pawn to b6 was played, and then white plays the move bishop to d3. Now, if you look at this position, after the move bishop to b7, white played the move bishop to h4. Now, this is very different position from the previous game we looked at because two things. One, the bishop is already outside the pawn chain, not on c1 anymore. And two, we see that this e4 square is not as weak as it was in the previous one. I mean, white has two pieces controlling this square. It's well guarded for the time being. And black doesn't have enough pieces to say hop a knight into the e4 square to try and take advantage of it. So already we see a much better version because white has solved the two main issues he had previously. Now, in this particular game, it continued knight to e7. So perhaps threatening to play the move knight to e4 here and then chasing our knight away with the move pawn to f6. So in this particular case, uh, what move can white play to prevent knight to e4? And the answer is the move queen to f3. So this is a typical sort of attacking formation you see a lot of players use, and it's quite difficult to deal with if you don't know uh, how to as black, because it's relatively easy to play as white. We just put the knight e5, the queen comes to f3, and then already white is looking to push on the king side with moves such as g4 here. And it's getting very, very dangerous for black. So in the game, um, black played a slight mistake with the move knight to g6, and after the move bishop to f2, black had to go back with knight to e7. But then already, there's a huge attack here for white, where I can just play the move pawn to g4. We see that g5 is coming, and this e4 square is well guarded by white's pieces, so it's already very difficult here to play as black and deal with this kingside pressure. Now, I guess in an ideal world, an ideal situation, black would have wanted to cover the e4 square a lot more. So if he did have the time, he probably would have wanted to bring the knight maneuvering somehow to the d6 square. Let's say, uh, I don't know exactly how he would have managed to get it, but let's say white plays some inaccurate moves, then he would have wanted to do something like this, where the knight hops back to d6. Again, the strategy for black doesn't change, which is covering the d6 square, and eventually black will try to bring the knight to d e4, um, and then play this uh, f6 move to try and chase away our e5 knight. So this is black's plan. Um, also, black can try to trade off these light squared bishops that we mentioned by playing moves such as queen c8 in this type of positions or maybe even a5 and then go, looking to go bishop a6 and trade off these light squared bishops. This is sort of a common way to uh, counter this as well. But as you can see, compared to the previous game, this was a much better version for white, and um, white had a lot more attacking opportunity. In the game, black decided to sacrifice a pawn on knight e4, but it didn't uh, prove to be enough compensation. So... I hope you guys enjoyed this particular video on the Stonewall and so sort of pick up some of these useful ideas and can apply them in your games. Um, as always, um, leave me some feedback down below if you have any. Otherwise, I'll catch you guys in the next pawn formation and um, take care. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.